How's it going? All right, welcome. First, I'd like to formally welcome everyone to the 2017 Public Speaking Contest. My name is Josh Matthews, and I'm the lead communication instructor here at Pitt Community College. Fun fact, this contest has uh, been going on since 1994. Before I introduce our Master of Ceremonies, I would like to acknowledge and thank this year's sponsors, or as I like to say, Friends of the Speech Contest. Chick-fil-A of Winterville, Duck Donuts of Greenville, McGraw-Hill Education, Menji's Bottling Group, PCC Foundation, and SGA. If we can, let's give our sponsors a round of applause. All right, now let me introduce our Master of Ceremonies. I know all of you are disappointed that you won't be able to hear my lovely voice, but I think that is a, uh, a good thing. <laughs> all right, Maurice Northern of Greenville is a second year student here at Pitt Community College. As a business major, he is also a very active member on campus. He serves as the SGA president, trust board member, as well as Bruiser's Crew mentor, among other things. Maurice enjoys poetry, music, and writing poetry in his spare time. Please give a warm welcome to our Master of Ceremonies, Maurice Northern. Afternoon, everyone. Um, also, another fun fact, this competition is two years older than me. <laughs> so that way you guys don't think I'm too old, all right? I know I look kind of... Anyway, um, I'm going to now introduce our lovely judges. First off, Mr. Greg Baldwin. Greg Baldwin is four years into his retirement and living life to the fullest extent. And of course, for those of you who may not know, Mr. Baldwin was a communications instructor here at PCC. Please give him a welcome round of applause. <laughs> a little bit of information on Mr. Baldwin. He is currently volunteering at many venues for different organizations. His current passion is pickleball, where he is proud to have risen to a novice level. He is attempting to lower his body mass index towards a normal level. Public speaking has left his radar, but we know it will be back on his radar after this contest today. Thank you. Up next, we have Mrs. Kelly Jones. Kelly Jones is no stranger to PCC. Please give her a welcome round of applause. to guide the studies of communications here at PCC in the role of lead communication instructor. Ms. Jones earned Teacher of the Year, served, at, served on a SACS accreditation team, and was involved in many other activities at Pitt CC. In her time, since, she's, since departing PCC, she enjoys blogging about her travels and her two adorable Labradoodles, Paddington and Sawyer. Round of applause, please. And last but not least, we have Mr. John Rincon. Please give him a round of applause as well. Mr. Rincon was born in Queens, New York. He is an executive learning technology representative for McGraw-Hill. Fun fact, he has also played hockey for 50 years. That is a long time. <laughs> He needs a round of applause for being able to stand 50 years of cold. That is, wow, okay. All right, I'm gonna go over the rules of this contest for those of you who are not familiar. Um, students have been, students competing today, sorry, signed up about a month ago. Our three judges will be the judge, will be judging on the following 10 criteria. Introduction, outside sources, logical reasoning, organization, language, vocal variety, conclusion, poise, 
eye contact and overall impression. The topic of discussion will be as follows. Each decade brings its own set of challenges requiring well-researched and thoughtful solutions. What do you think is the top social issue facing us today? Global warming, homelessness, living wage, crime, or some other concern? Gather research from credible sources to help you examine your topic and select your content for your approach. Narrow your focus to a single issue. Consider these questions as you develop your speech. What factors impact the issue? How important is it to address this issue? And what can be done to positively address the issue? Each speech will be between four and five minutes. Any presentation under four minutes or over five minutes will have a point penalty. Now, I will be introducing our first speaker. Our first speaker is Zach Martinez. If you will, please come to the front. You can get him. Zach Martinez, his hometown is Wake Forest, North Carolina, but he was born and raised in San Jose, California. His major is applied sociology, and he plans to return to East Carolina University to finish that degree. He has plans to obtain a master's degree for, from that as well. Lastly, Zach works with an organization of New Greenville. Please give a welcoming round of applause for Zach Martinez. How's everyone doing today? All right, you ready? Good? Get on time. All right, cool. Each decade brings new social issues, global warming, uh, healthcare, poverty, etc. But the issue I find most important today is genocide. It's a controversial issue because it's hard to define and it's hard to agree on what that definition actually is. Today I want to discuss how genocide occurs and what genocide actually is, uh, where it takes place, and what can be done to prevent this issue. Um, this, genocide is a topic that's always been important to me. Uh, I took a class in high school called Genes or Holocaust and Genocide. It really opened up my eyes to this topic and how important it is because it continuously happens. Um, I'm going to begin with my first point. Uh, I want to begin with a, what the definition of genocide actually is. It's the deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those within a particular ethnic group or nation. Um, the easiest way, I mean, that definition doesn't necessarily work well because it's so short, and it actually encompasses a lot more under that definition. And the easier way to understand it are the ten stages of genocide, and this can be found on the Genocide Watch website. The first stage is classification, us first them. The Hutus and the Tutsis are a good example, the Nazis and the Jews, so on and so forth. The next stage is symbolization. The best example I can give is the Star of David for the Jews. Uh, the next stage is discrimination, where the policies change for these certain groups of people and they're denied rights. Um, the, next, uh, the next stage is dehumanization. Uh, these, people, these groups of people are referred to as insects, animals, vermin, or a disease on society. The next stage is organization, which the state, usually the country involved, sponsors militias to defuse responsibility and put that on militias and to deny it on themselves. Uh, polarization follows where the groups are driven apart and you silence the moderates, the people who aren't part of that group, who were caught in the middle. Uh, the next stage is preparation, which is buying weapons, creating a plan. Uh, the best example I can give is the final solution by the Nazis that was written out. Uh, the next stage is persecution, where the victims are identified, lists are drawn up, and those groups are separated, put in the ghettos, and so on. Uh, extermination follows into the killers. It's viewed as an extermination because the people are viewed as vermin, animals, a disease on society. And, but this is the point where the mass killings actually become genocide. Uh, the, the following stage is denial. And this is where the countries or the people involved, the perpetrators, try to cover up evidence. Uh, the best example of this I can give is Turkey today, where a genocide, the Armenian genocide occurred in the early 1900s, but they've yet to confirm that it's a war to them, but to others it is a genocide. My next point, uh, I'd like to begin with a quote from Elie Wiesel, and Elie Wiesel was a Holocaust survivor. Uh, he's quoted in saying never again. There's more to that, that, but he's known for saying never again. However, these things currently happen today with the Islamic State or ISIS against the Yazidi, the Shia, and the Christians. 
Uh, genocides have happened throughout history. The United States versus the Native Americans, Nazi Germany versus multiple groups, the Cambodia genocide with Khmer Rouge, and that genocide was against intellectuals and people connected to the former government. Throughout the 20th century, six to seven genocides have occurred, but that number is argued because it is, again, hard to define exactly what a genocide is. Um, my final point I'd like to make is how, what can be done to prevent genocide. And there's no sure way to stop genocide because it, it takes a whole society for it to happen in the, to begin with. Um, through the website End Genocide, the, what they recommend is to sound the alarm and demand action. Hold the leaders accountable who commit these atrocities. You can stop the enablers because it's not just one country that takes control and commits genocide. It is others, it's corporations and other countries. It's a collective effort. And the next and the final recommendation that they have is to make human rights and genocide prevention a value of the U.S. foreign policy. Um, in, closing, uh, I'd like, in closing, today I've discussed uh, how genocide occurs and what genocide is, where it has happened, and what can be done to prevent genocide. In my final statement, I'd like to say, we keep saying never again, but these atrocities continue to happen today. It takes everyone to prevent these atrocities, and it's a collective effort. Thank you. Great speech, great speech. Another round of applause for Zach, please. Now, um, we have a very special uh, speaker coming to the stage because he decided he didn't want a bio because he's cool like that. Please put together your hands for Timothy Battle. My topic today that I'm going to be talking to you guys about is strictly about po uh, poverty. My name is Timothy Battle, and today I'm going to be addressing the state of poverty in America. In today's day and age, we as a nation are divided by so many borders forged by religion, financial status, class, education, politics, sexuality, and so on. Amongst this list resides two very striking issues that, divide mankind for, that have divided mankind for centuries. Poverty and religion. So my purpose here today is to enlighten those who might find themselves unaware of the vast amount of poverty in the United States. Your first question may be, when did poverty in the, in, the, in the United States start? Since our country is amongst the richest amount of countries in the, uh, in, the, in, in the world, you may not know that poverty is actually very popular in our country. The origins of poverty date back to the 16th century, however, with the emergence of the new world, increased trade and arrival of modern economics. Poverty emerged simultaneously with wealth that increased gaps within, uh, within uh, nations and through combinations of, ge of geographical uh, location, politics, and access to resources and training. Fast forward to the 21st century. In 2016, the nation's census was 324.4 million people. 43.1 million of those people lived in poverty, so that means that the rate of poverty was 13.5%. Now, who lives in poverty may be your next question. Who lives in poverty is decided by the government, which is a system that they use called the poverty threshold. The poverty threshold is a system that they use to count the number of poor people living in America. For example, a family of four at the lowest poverty threshold designed by the government is a family that makes $24,000 annually. According to the 2016 U.S. Census data, the highest poverty rate by race is found among blacks at the top of the list 24.1%. Next is Hispanics, the second list, or the second top of the list, at 21.4%. Asians at third, at 11.4%, and whites at fourth, at 9%. Now, I'd like to go into more depth about those statistics. So in 2016, there was a recorded 46 million African Americans living in the United States. Now it is well known, now it is well known that African Americans are a minority along with other ethnicities. But what caught my attention about these numbers is the fact that there are only 46 million African Americans living in the United States, but 11 out of those 46 million are living in poverty. 
Compared to the whites in America, whose populations as of 2016 is 245 million out of the 324.4 million uh, people that we have living in the states, only 22 million of those 245 million live in poverty. That's a mind-blowing statistic. Compared to 46 million African Americans living in America, 24% of them are living in poverty, and compared to 245 million whites living in America, only 9% of them live in poverty. Now, there are many factors that contribute towards the reasons why whites and blacks have such a large gap between their poverty rates, but I won't go into depth about that today. So, in conclusion, my purpose of this speech isn't to urge everyone to find a solution to poverty and go outside and join a march and join groups or so, so on and so forth. My general purpose is to lend knowledgeable insight into the world of so many suffering Americans. Poverty isn't only an issue in the United States, it's a global-wide issue that we have faced for centuries now, and no one knows how much longer we're going to endure it. Thank you. One more round of applause for Mr. Tim. <laughs> These speeches are good. Do you guys enjoy these speeches like I am? Or is it just me? It's, it's just me. It's just me and these judges, because you guys are just I'm tired. Ready to go home? Go to work? Go to sleep? OK, all right. Our next contestant is a young lady by the name of Megan Carswell. Currently, a few more? Three, four minutes. Give us three, four minutes. The judges are working. All right. Our next contestant is a young lady by the name of Megan Carswell. Currently completing third semester at Pitt CC, she has been accepted to Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. She plans to attend Liberty this fall, hopes to double major in global studies and child development. She's very interested in martial arts and she recently tested for first degree black belt in Taekwondo. She loves to travel overseas and intends to learn more about other cultures and lifestyles. An ideal job for Megan will be working overseas as a child life specialist, helping youth that have endured trauma. Please give me a round of applause for Miss Megan. Imagine the suffocation of a dark room. You are trapped against your will. Imagine the helpless, numbing sensation of not being able to decide what you will do next. You are a puppet marionette, trapped and controlled by a crafty, conniving mastermind. Imagine an incessant pain that seeps to your bones. You see, you are forced to work countless hours in one day with little to no sleep, and a scant amount of food is given to you not as a right, but a reward. This is modern day slavery, and this affects millions of people around the world today. You may open your eyes now, but only if you are really ready to see because once you know about something, you no longer have the excuse of not knowing. As the great social activist William Wilberforce once said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say that you did not know. In five minutes, I cannot fully inform you on human trafficking, but I can pique your interest. In this speech, it is my hope to answer the questions, what is human trafficking? Where does it happen and why should you get involved? The Department of Homeland Security defines human trafficking as modern slavery, and it involves the use of force, fraud, or coercion to obtain some type of labor or commercial sex act. 
This atrocious beast swallows millions of men, women, and children every year. So where does this happen? Of the millions of people it affects? It is not a respecter of persons. It does not differentiate between race, age, ethnicity, gender, religion. It, it sees none of that. Anyone could be a victim. Amanda Clower, editor of Change.org, writes in a CNN Freedom Project article, while poverty, lack of education, and belonging to a marginalized group are all factors of being trafficked, Victims of modern-day slavery have included children of middle-class families, women with college degrees, and people from dominant religions and ethnic groups. Human trafficking does not only happen overseas. The DHS has also informed us that human trafficking has been reported in every state. And our beloved North Carolina ranks number eight for those with the highest activity of human trafficking. So why should you get involved? Human trafficking just isn't in your town, it could be in your home. Since human trafficking's victims are forced to make many of the products we use every day. Clower from CNN Freedom continues to say, if you are wearing gold jewelry, athletic shoes, or cotton underwear, you might be wearing something made by slaves. And if your home contains a rug, a soccer ball, a cell phone, I know we all have those, or Christmas decorations, then slavery quite possibly is in your house. You should get involved in the fight against human trafficking because unknowingly, you could be supporting and contributing to this business. To conclude, I hope you can now define human trafficking, know where it happens, and why you should get involved. One of the biggest ways to fight this beast is to spread awareness. I'll never forget, after speaking to a group of teenagers, educating them on this issue, a young girl walked up to me in tears and embraced me. She whispered, thank you so much for talking to us. This almost happened to me. Now I know its name. When we stand together, and shed a light in the darkness, shed a light, the darkness is forced to become small. And so I urge you to pick up your torch so that we can expose the underbelly of human trafficking to the light and cause it to flee. You decided to open your eyes, but choosing to see is not enough. So I ask, what will you do with what you now know? Thank you. That concludes our contestants. Um, we have about 10 minutes for the judges to tally up their results and their scores for the three contestants. By all means, have at the food in the back. There's drinks and there's refreshments in the back. Thank you. If you will, please find your way back to your seat. And if we can have the three contestants come on stage. All right, everyone, let's give them another round of applause for <laughs> Okay, so basically the highest score wins. We will start with number uh, well, third place, and then work our way to first. Coming in at third, we have Timothy Battle. In second place, we have Zach Martinez. And you guessed it, our winner of this year's public speaking contest is Megan. All right, at this point, I need to pay everyone out up here with their prize money. Feel free to take off, this concludes the event. 
We still have a good amount of refreshments in the back. We also have bags. If you would like to take some food to go, please do that. Do not leave any. And again, thanks for coming out today.